I was riding on the coast starting my morning ride and I came upon a cyclist to my right who I passed. Once I passed that cyclist, I audibly heard him click a couple gears down and I thought to myself, I'm going to have some company for a while. And I did. He caught up to me, sat on my wheel, and uh, I didn't want to change my workout. I didn't want to accelerate all of a sudden. I didn't want to slow way down. I just wanted to keep riding, but it was just kind of annoying. Uh, this person didn't say a word to me. He didn't say, hey, can I sit on your wheel? He just sat on my wheel. And in his mind, he was probably trying to keep up, if not race me. Uh, lo and behold, we were surpassed by a teenage girl in flip-flops and a hoodie on a beach cruiser, but it was an electric bike. As soon as she passed us going maybe three or four miles per hour faster, he jumped around me, got on her wheel, and did the same thing. I was kind of keeping pace. I, I don't normally draft off people I don't know or didn't start the group ride with. And so I kept my distance. I was about 10 bike lengths behind watching this whole thing unfold. He shot up, sat right on her wheel, and she was a little bit freaked out. She was, She's not somebody who's used to having a complete stranger draft off of her. And she was... Uh, she didn't say anything, but he was very aggressive towards her. At a certain point, I was thinking, you know what? This is too dangerous. I want to go ahead and say something to this person. I kind of accelerated, but they blew through a red light, which is another pet peeve of mine, and I they were gone. But if you are one of those people out there listening, and here's my point. My point is, do not be reactionary on your ride. Ride your own ride. Don't go out there on rides and think, I'm going to go and draft off of every single person that passes me. Stick to your plan. And the more you do that, that's more self-discipline. You get a better workout. You burn more calories. And it's safer. This person who passed me and was on my wheel just by sheer looks, uh, and I know I'm being judgy, but this person is probably not an experienced cyclist, probably not a bike racer, and probably not someone, definitely not somebody I've ever seen on a group ride before, let alone a race. This person probably spends the majority of their time going up and down the coast, north to south, south to north, and they are just looking, they're, they're, they're sort of the human version of a digital troll. And what they do is they ride, but they wait for someone to pass them just so they can draft off them and race them. Do not be this person. If you're that determined and that hell bent on drafting off someone that you don't know or you're not, or you're not friends with, or you didn't start the ride with, ask them, say, hey, can I sit on your wheel for the next 20 miles or whatever the case may be? Because it's annoying to the person who passed you to just have that person you can literally hear breathing behind you on your back an inch off your wheel. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to the rider. And it's just not good etiquette. And had something happened to this girl in flip-flops riding the e-bike, uh, that person, it would have been that person's fault because they were following too close and riding too aggressively. If that person is really so much, so determined on drafting, join a track class, Sh sign up for a race. But I think people have gotten so used to this hyper aggressive culture of, I'm just going to sit on the next person that passes me and how dare they try to pass me. Look, people have varying ability levels, varying fitness levels, ride your ride, stick to your ride. Don't be that person who goes out for a spin and then all of a sudden it turns into an FTP test because you want to race every single person around you. So that's my advice. Uh, what I do normally when I pass people is I pass them quickly. Hopefully that discourages them not to sit on my wheel. If they do sit on my wheel, I'll pull far to the right and wave them with my left hand. Just go ahead and pass me. If they don't and they just do sit on my wheel, Here's a trick. I slow down maybe a half a mile an hour slower every 30 seconds. So if we're going 20 miles an hour, it'll go down to 15 miles an hour in a few minutes. And hopefully by then they have taken the hint that they can pass me. And I've done 
and the very last resort is I don't want to get confrontational, but I'll just say, hey, go around me. And usually 99% of the time they do, but don't be that person who just, if someone passes you, you have to get up out of the saddle, click down two gears and sit on their wheel for what? Just so you can have less of a workout? I don't know, something to think about. Okay, on today's show, we've got a couple of different things. We've got Sam Boardman, professional cyclist who did the tour of California and is starting the tour of Utah today. We've also got our Ask a Lawyer segment with our resident attorney, Josh Benici. And we've got some great things coming up. I'm heading to Colorado for the SBT gravel event in Steamboat Springs. So stay tuned for that. Hope you enjoy the show. Come explore the beautiful Sonoran Desert in Southern Arizona through Tanak Championship Coaching. It's an Arizona-based coaching team founded by former mountain bike pro and world champion Jason Tullis. Coaches will be hosting a training camp for four days and finish with the Mount Lemmon Gravel Grinder in Oracle, Arizona on October 26. It's a 40, 50, or 60 mile race that offers Arizona backcountry riding in the picturesque Sonoran Desert. Lodging and meals will be provided along with ride support and bike maintenance, and before the camp, They'll practice bike skills as well as bike setup, nutrition, training, and recovery. Tanak Championship Coaching has worked with athletes to achieve their goals, and they've stepped on thousands of podiums around the world. For more information, go to gotanak.com. That's G-O-T-E-N-A-C.com. Time now for Ask a Lawyer with our resident attorney, Josh Benici, as we talk about the three-foot rule. And remember, Josh Benici is a lawyer, but he's not your lawyer. So please consult one for your legal needs. We're back with Josh Benici of BeniciLawGroup.com. Find him on Facebook as well as the website. And on Instagram, you can find him at SD Bike Lawyer. Josh, I was riding this morning. And I would say I was riding, you know, very consciously. I've been someone who's been in several bike accidents, both in bike races and out on the road. And I would probably say that about 50% of the cars that passed me, half of them were less than three feet within me and the other 50% were more than three feet. In California, we have this three foot rule law. I, do we, I don't know if we call it law, but three foot rule. It is part of the California Vehicle Code now. It's section 21760. Uh, and it was put into effect about a year or two ago. Um, so it is a law. Okay. Um, it's the same as that you have to stop at a red light. It's the same as you shouldn't go over what the posted speed limit is. So in theory, more than half of those cars, say 200 of them, were breaking the law today. Yep. And I would, I'm willing to bet that zero ever got a ticket, a fine, yep. pulled over, anything like that. Does that law exist just for... The lawmaker says, say, we're doing something. <laughs> Some would say that, right? Um, I would say it's a step in the right direction. I th- still think three feet is kind of silly, um, to, to put it lightly. Um, whenever somebody you know, comes up in conversation, all that three foot rule, and I go, okay, you know what? Next time you're somewhere where there's a train, even a subway, I want you to go out, I want you to measure three feet from where the subway is going to be and stand there when it goes by. The nice part about the subway is it's not going to deviate. It's on rails. But it's still like, oh, they get the rush of the wind. You know, you get a little adrenaline. It's right there. And now imagine being that close to something almost just as heavy, but it's not on rails. Now I think hopefully when I tell people that, they kind of get that light bulb of, oh, wow, three feet really is not that far away. Right. Yeah. And, and we're talking for the people that go closer than three feet. I mean, they're inches away from seriously hurting you or ending your life with no they are breaking the law but when they pass you they don't think about it twice to the cyclist that's what's keeping them up at night they're a little bit shaken they may need to pull over i mean it's really scary um so is anything being done what can be done about it uh from the cyclist point of view uh what can drivers do better uh so they don't necessarily have to take on oncoming traffic in the opposite lane Ideally, and you know, the law actually says that a car is not supposed to pass a cyclist or a disabled vehicle if it's not safe to, to do so with oncoming traffic. Really, they're supposed to stay within the lane if it's a double yellow, let's say, um, until it's safe to pass without coming three feet from the um, 
pedestrian, the cyclist, whomever it might be. Um, for the cyclist, when that happens, it's happened to me all the time. I mean, I, I was uh, coming down a local descent and a truck came by. I swear I could have reached out and touched it. And it's scary. What can we do? Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot to do. If you're running a front camera and you actually do get the license plate, um, there are databases in different jurisdictions where you can upload it um, so that if for some reason that, that car in the future hits somebody, you can almost show it as a repeated defender, right? Um, and that if, like this, let's say, oh, I didn't hit this cyclist, I never got close to cyclists, and you bring this up, um, it can be impeaching evidence, right? Um, I think I've had a couple of friends send it to the police station and they really haven't done much with it. Um, I think the police look at it as, hey, I took a video of this guy running a stop sign, and they're mm -hmm. going, okay, well, you're right, <laughs> but we got bigger fish to fry. Yeah, they're out catching a serial killer or something. So they say. So they say. <laughs> but uh, oh, that is the tough part. So, yes, it is the law. Enforcement is the hardest part as with anything, right? And I think enforcement is just one key. It also has to do with awareness. There's a lot of drivers out there that don't drive with the sort of spatial awareness. And I'm not talking about just buzzing cyclists. I'm talking about like, hey, if there's a queue of cars wanting to turn left and then, <laughs> you know, there's a car that just could have scooched forward to let the cars behind get in that lane totally unaware they're, but they're like three car lengths behind and there's a whole queue of cars with their signal on right so it's that kind of spatial awareness i mean again we're in southern california notorious for traffic among other things but you know if you ever want to be enraged just go to any target parking lot <laughs> watch how people park oh it makes me crazy how people lose all sense of um space and direction once they get in a parking lot uh, for that matter but you know just Understanding, and I, I, you know, again, I think we've talked about this before. N people not having ridden on the road before, they just don't understand it. Yeah. Right. I think there's a meme out there where someone passes, you know, uh, three feet away. Okay, they're abiding by the law. Someone who passes 16 feet is a cyclist, <laughs> right? Um, or has a family member that's a cyclist. Um, it, it's tough. And with some of the road, you know, some of the backcountry roads that we like to ride because they're usually a little less traveled and scenic. Um, there's not a whole lot of room. So when people are trying to squeeze by you, there's not much where to go on the right hand side. They're trying to squeeze by there's oncoming traffic. You know, there's a lot to try to accomplish there. And as a cyclist, you're trying to stay on the right hand side to try to be polite. Sometimes that gets you more in trouble. Um, you know, again, like I said, I think it's a step in the right direction, but enforcement needs to be stepped up. And we shouldn't even have to have this kind of law because it's just common sense. Three feet. Three feet. It's it's common sense. And, you know, I I was in, in Europe uh, covering the pros and the drivers there are either very aware of the law or are used to having to pass cyclists and pedestrians because they give so much room. I thought every driver was a cyclist. Mm -hmm. They give so they they're it's almost too much room. <laughs> and uh, and the riders, you know, have right of way during, um, you know, like they go, they don't have as many light signals, but they do have traffic circles. Right. And they just know how to flow in and out of traffic a it's, little bit smoother. It's been part of their culture for so long, I feel like. And I think having so much infrastructure across the pond, too, that is bike centered, that people understand, OK, no, hey, we're all kind of one team here. Right. Um, where we are here in SoCal and um, a lot of other places in the u.s it just has not gotten to be that culture and everyone's been so dependent on cars that um that's all they consider everyone has a car so why are you riding a bike in a way right oh there there are lawmakers out there that are saying cyclists uh are mooching off of uh, taxpayer dollars because they don't contribute to uh you know road or gas tax or things like that i mean it's it's pretty extreme. But again, we're talking to an audience that is probably more educated than the average driver out there, since most people listening are cyclists. So so they kind of know this. But I think if they just tell their friends or their relatives or just people that they hang with that aren't cyclists just raises that awareness just a little bit. There's this 
video, I think in the UK, of somebody who wanted to demonstrate the three foot rule in real life. So he took one of those like foam swimming pool the noodles. Pool noodles. Uh huh. They were bike packing, I yeah, think. Yeah, attached it to the rear of his bike, but then it stuck out three feet and riding along, and then showed how many people actually would hit it. And of course, if you touch it, you're within three feet. So that's kind of a visual demonstration. But again, you're not you're not playing around. This is like somebody you could actually kill right. or hurt, right. which is uh, unfortunate. So uh, is, it's, is it more of a matter of education than saying, let's just put another law in place or both? I, I definitely think education is the number one thing we need to be focused on. Um, the best way to do that, I haven't come up with one yet. Um, you know, I, I do think the the uh, drop of water effect in every cyclist trying to abide by the law, trying to be polite, trying to wave cars through when they can and get over and say thank you for certain things. I think that's probably the, the slowest but maybe the most grassroots way of trying to educate drivers to respect cyclists a little bit more um, and to, you know, give some of that respect back. I think it's it's hard to do a lot of times because you have to be so defensive when you're riding, but, you know, education, I think, is, is the, the main factor there on top of what the law is, um, and hopefully those two can kind of come together. To your knowledge, do you know of anyone that's ever gotten a ticket for violating the three-foot rule, or has... Dude, I mean, has a cop even written a ticket for that? So I've seen videos online of stings. So they'd be a cop with a bunch of um, some sort of meters and computers on his bike, and then someone would pass him, and it would actually show the distance between the cyclist and the car, and there'd be a motorcycle cop down the street, and they'd radio in, and they'd get a ticket. Really? I don't remember where that was taken, but I have seen it, and I was like, oh, my gosh, we need more of that. Even if that happens once a month, you know, in highly dense uh, cycling areas, will that do anything to actually educate drivers to stop doing that? I don't know. Right. But I think it'd be a good start. And, you know, I mean, if they're going to give us tickets for you know, not cramping our wheels to the curb and to, to try to raise <laughs> money for the city, why not do it that way to keep people safe, right? Yeah. And I know that the response of every driver is, there's a three-foot law? I mean, that's probably the first thing that's going to come out of that. Right. Map. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right, Josh Benici, thanks so much for the input. Thanks. Coming up, Sam Boardman talks about his experience racing the Tour of California as well as life as a pro. Are you a cyclist in need of an attorney? Well, look no further because Benici Law Group is here to help. They have three full-time attorneys who deal specifically with bicycle accidents. They cover all types of cases, and not to mention Josh Benici is not only a lawyer, but he's a cyclist himself. He's participated in the Belgian Waffle Ride as well as Leadville, and has sponsored teams such as the local SDBC team and the SD Velodrome. For more information, check out BeniciLawGroup.com or SDDisabilityAttorney.com. So for the people that don't know you, you are um, currently riding for the Wildlife Generation Pro Cycling Team, mm -hmm. formerly known as Jelly Belly, yep. run by Danny Van Houten, the same great staff that they've had. Mm -hmm. And before that, you were on the Mark Pro Cycling Team. Mm -hmm. And then before that, you were on UCLA? Yeah, uh, started racing collegiately in... 2015 and yeah started in the collegiate scene at ucla my freshman year and took off from there kind of rode within the collegiate scene as the bulk of my racing and did some open cat races with a local amateur team based out of redondo beach called big orange cycling oh yeah it's kind of like the big fans yeah they have one rule don't be a dick don't be a dick i have a pair of socks that say that on the bottom and i still wear those <laughs> i actually wore those to a JoJ demo i was doing at an rei with jess <laughs> She wanted me to get rid of them, but I was like, it was in Manhattan Beach. I'm like, you got to know your crowd. And yeah. lo and behold, Lauren Mulwitz, who I think used to date Greg Leibert, who's the president, the president of the team, she walked oh. in. So my intuition is correct. Yes. Um, so I wrote for them for two years uh, alongside UCLA. And then in 2017, uh, after I, ha I had done a stint in Europe where I lived in Belgium for the summer and then also did uh, an exchange program in Spain, came back and that year raced for Herbalife 24 P3 
he be uh, Mark Pro Nature's Bakery, which then morphed into Mark Pro Cycling Team. Gotcha. So that was like the domestic elite uh, team that I rode for that introduced me into NRC racing, PRT racing in the States. And then from there, got on to Wildlife Generation this year, and yeah, just been full-time into it. Are you allowed to talk about next year? I don't know what's going on next year. Did uh, you sign a multi-year contract? No, or? we've only signed one-year contracts. Okay. And so my hope is to talk to Danny a little bit, see what his expectations are, uh, and get get him to sit down and just chat it up at Pronats. Hopefully we'll have some time to do that. Uh, yeah. But right now, just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if there were ever a team to be on that could help riders get to the next level i would say wildlife is right up there i mean if you think about all the people that came through the jelly belly program on the bigger teams you're in a very very good spot i think it's an amazing stepping stone and i think as a development program and in my own development it's been phenomenal just because coming from the amateur racing scene kind of taking the step up from collegiate to amateur to a continental professional you i've you get to see in that transition just how much of a difference just little bits of support can make. Mm-hmm. I mean, as a collegiate student, I remember, I mean, we had to go and set up our own home race up in Pear Blossom for the UCLA road oh, yeah. race. I don't know if you've ever done that one. It's in Devil's Punch Bowl. And I encourage anyone who's listening to this, if you can, go out and support the race. It is a large part of what keeps the collegiate program going. But we had to wake up at 2.45 in the morning to get that set up. And that's an awkward experience as a collegiate student. It's because you wake up at 2.45 and you're getting all your stuff out into the vans and the little like, parking areas and you're going and getting your day started when most other college students are going to bed. Like they're going, still up from the night. They're before. still up from the night before. <laughs> like their evening isn't over yet. So you're kind of in this weird cross where you're walking by and you two are both awake, but you're in very different parts of your day. And so <laughs> like we woke up, we'd have to go drive two hours to the location, get the tent set up, get the porta pies set up, get the reg set up, all that, and then you're expected to go race. So yeah, there, like, you know, there's a joke among collegiate cyclists that you major in cycling. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, you'd put in just as many hours as you would as your as your undergrad major yeah if not more <laughs> i think that was the joke i made to my parents who were begrudgingly listening to that as i was making it but i mean truth be told for me it that couldn't be closer to the truth in part because as an english major uh one of the tricks i learned was i could just find the audio version of the book that we were assigned and then just listen to that on a ride so mm-hmm. i was able to kind of knock two birds out with one stone and that made my life so much easier but again it's kind of like i think it was the only thing that allowed me to survive because cycling unlike other sports requires just so much time and when a five or six hour training ride is on the docket and you get back you're kind of useless all day and then sometimes after that was over you know i'd I'd wake up at six in the morning and then i'd have to go to class at like two and it's like (laughs) You're wrecked. That is bad. Were you, so you didn't start cycling until college or were you riding in high school? No, I didn't uh, ride at all uh, until college. Uh, I didn't race at all until college. I was kind of getting into bikes the summer before my freshman year, but I ran in high school. So high school, I ran track and field and cross country all four years. And that was my thing. Like, that's what I really love to do. But Running's a brutal sport. Like, it's long distance running is. Yeah, I think... no no disrespect to the hundred meter guys and girls a, yeah. or two hundred, but I was on the cross country team and track in high school, yeah. and and it's funny because if you, I think if collegiate cycling wanted to recruit high schoolers, they should target the cross country team. No, it's a and good I, crossover I or mean, soccer. You are totally right in that, and I think you talk to most cyclists. And I bet you some crazy percentage of it come from a running background or something like that. But and the cyclists who do come from a really high end per, like level of running end up being really good cyclists. I mean, you look at it, case in point, the example everyone goes to is Mike Woods. He was an Olympic level runner when he was 18, sub four minute miler when he was 18 or 19 years old. And now he's won grand tour stages. So it's like. I had so many friends of mine who ran in collegiate programs and were really good. And then they just either were injured or burnt out. And then they went to cycling and lo and behold, they're just thrashing everybody when they get on the bike. And so I tell everybody, like, you should 
if you're really good at running, stop running and ride a bike because you'll be really good at riding bikes. But for me, I was never really good at running. I, and I think that was the brutal part of it for me. It's like I poured my blood, sweat, and tears into that sport. And it was just like so hard for me to excel in it. And I think that was just through my own like misinformation about nutrition and all that kind of stuff there's just like in high school it was just so dumb and i like i didn't know anything about basic training methodology or recovery or anything like that i was like if i run more i'll be better yeah <laughs> but just being that young that takes care of part of the recovery right there. oh just yeah. being at that age and nutrition to yeah. a large part but i think also something about cross country and long distance or just endurance athletes in high school there's that like cross country nerd factor oh like, completely i take it you didn't slack off in high school because you went to ucla so you must have been like a really really top yeah like, and, were you the valedictorian of your school no we didn't really have valedictorians in my school i like i i did really well in high school but i think it was like looking back on it now i kind of wish i was able to go back in time and just tell myself to like chill out like relax because it's like there were times when i was putting so much effort into each of the assignments i was given where it's you know it was getting to the point where i was just going to bed at like 1 30 in the morning because i wanted to study hard and do well but then i'm waking up at 6 45 to like get to school and get class started and it's like when you're burning the candle at both ends like that of course you're not going to pro- perform well because it's like you're not going to be able to recover but again, because you're young, you can kind of get away with that in, for a while, and you get lulled into this idea as, oh, you know, I can I can keep doing that. But at the end of the day, it frustrates me because looking back on it now, I feel like I could have made so much more of my high school running career, if you can call it that, if I had just taken the time to actually like sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sleep is Eat correctly <laughs> so important. I mean. Also, too, but where does that drive come from? Is it like, was it your parents? Is it just you? Or is it your teachers? Like, I think uh, for me, I had the privilege of going to a really competitive, excellent private high school. And, you know, by the hard work of my parents who allowed that to happen, I wanted to make good on that opportunity. And so for me, making good on that opportunity was working as hard as I could in school to, you know, make sure that I was putting as much effort into each assignment as possible and getting the most out of it. And consequently, that meant going to a really good college. And in my mind, that was, you know, part personal fulfillment, part making good on, you know, the things that have been presented to me in life. And I wanted to make sure that I did make good on that. But then it's funny, you get to college and when grad school or post-collegiate education, master's, PhD, whatever it may be, is not in your immediate track as far as your pathway it becomes harder to motivate because in high school for example for most people the goal is to get into a good college so obviously like you have that motivation to work hard because you see a very clear goal you get good grades you apply to a college you get in boom that's you know very clear cut college it's a little more gray as far as the pathway that you can take i mean with grad school and or a master's degree not really in my mind I was thinking halfway through I'm like you know what am I working for right now obviously personal fulfillment and it's not that I slacked off but you just learn very quickly like what it is that you actually need to do and what it is that you don't need to do and I think I did really well in college but again it's like half of college was just learning like how to balance life and you know, your own uh, extracurricular pursuits and also just your sanity. (laughs) (laughs) Were you planning on, you said you're an English major. Were you planning on a career in in writing or something like that? Um, I, I guess I was an, I was an English Spanish major. So I have two degrees. Um, and I guess basically in reading, um, (laughs) majored in reading, but I think, I wanted to go into teaching, and I still do, and currently I'm registered as a substitute teacher in California, and I'm in the process of registering with the district and registering with local uh, high school union districts just to see if I can get into do some substitute teaching in the off season, just because I think that would be a really fun thing to do, you know, once cycling is over, Uh, but I think 
you know, I've always liked being able to write well, being able to convey a point well through writing. And I think in cycling and in sport in general, which I think is hard to explain when you are at your most lucid, I think it's it's cool to have in my arsenal an ability to write and type things out. And I've always liked doing that. And I'm trying to like motivate myself to do that, which is why I'm building a website, making a blog right now, which hopefully I'll be able to get out soon, just motivating myself to do that. Because it's kind of, you have to figure out what you want to write about and then yeah. make sure that it's something people think is going to be worth reading. Yeah. Well, it's funny too, because UCLA, maybe it's serendipity, but there are some, A, it's a good school. It's a great school. Mm-hmm. But B, for the cycling team, there are some great people to come out of that program um, we've had Maddie Ward on the show before, and mm-hmm. she did some diaries, and yeah. she's, you know, I think pre-med maybe. Yeah, I and, raced with Maddie uh, a bunch. Like, so you raced with her hitter. while she was at UCLA? Mm-hmm. And then I had another guy do an article for me, Evan Christensen. Yep, Evan. Wrote about collegiate gnats, and mm-hmm. he wrote this article, and it like just rocked me because it's about he's in the middle of collegiate gnats, He's not going to win, and he just wants to quit cycling altogether. <laughs> I think I was actually reading that uh, recently. It, what was the title of it? It's, it's Collegiate uh, Nationals from the Perspective of a Burnout. Yeah, through the eyes like of that. a burnout. <laughs> I, yeah, I thought that was great. Uh, Did you ride with him on, on the team? Yep, okay. I know both of those people really well. And I, I think you're completely right. UCLA, for me, and for a lot of people, was an amazing place to launch, uh, I guess you could call it, endeavors into cycling. It's still weird to think of it as a career in cycling. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it was perfect because not only was it a place where it had a really good program as far as cycling and as far as uh, like the people that have come out of the program and the investment that a lot of people put into it, but the collegiate cycling scene in the West Coast is really strong uh racing all up and down california and it's also the training in la area i think is best in california personally i love 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 the mountains in malibu like i think that's my favorite place to ride gotta get those strava sections before phil takes them all right he already has them all (laughs) oh that's right he already does (laughs) he has them all uh i mean every single one Uh, it's like i try to go for a couple but There was that one time when I think I took, like, this coveted climb in uh, Brentwood, which is West L.A. It's Mandeville Canyon. Oh, yeah. That's only, like, 5%. It's It's not not super steep. It's funny. It's not that great of a hill. Like, it's not like it's pretty or it has a view at the top. You end at a gate, and it's, like, in a neighborhood. You can't – it's not like you can turn around and see a beautiful view. You're looking down a neighborhood road. And it's never really any steeper than five percent in the fir- in like the first seven out of eight kilometers, and then the last K, it's maybe you know pitches of ten percent, and then there's a section the wall, and that's the last bit of it, which is maybe like a fifteen percent thirty second kicker. It's not that great of a hill, but for some reason it's like the segment, like everyone. It's like oh, it's go for Mandeville time. Like there's an entire group ride on the Fourth of July that goes for the segment. Like really? that's the yeah, it's the Fourth of July ride, and they go so hard up this segment, and no one's come close to Phil's Phil's time except actually, I think he has it now. But it was funny. This random French rider who I think was riding for Vital Concept was in town doing I don't know what. And then he went and smashed Phil's time by 30 seconds. And then Phil texts me and he's like, who is this guy? And I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. It didn't get flagged. No, it did not get flagged. But now the segment's flagged, I think, because oh. something, someone's being a dingus or something and flagged the segment because too many people are going for it. But Too many e-bikes. Too many e-bikes. No, I've done that climb. And it is, it's, yeah, it's just houses. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a neighborhood at. road. It's not, it's, it's not cool other than the fact that everyone rides it. Right. It's just like every industrial park. Yeah. The, the course itself is not necessarily cool. It's just a, a park. But when everybody does it. It's like when, if CBR had <laughs> an, a hill climb, that's the road they would do it on. Yeah. So let's talk about when you got the call up to do Tour of California for Team USA. What was what was that whole experience like? Oh man. Uh well, 
the experience was amazing. And I think to categorize it, I've been hearing this a lot recently. Maybe it's just because there have been a bunch of, you know, dirty cans of posts, Belgian waffle ride posts, a bunch of epic ride posts recently talking about type two fun or it's like, <laughs> It's only fun retrospectively, but in the yeah. moment, you're like, I want to die. Yeah, I think <laughs> this, this sucks. Selling my bike. I mean, I think for me, California was just something completely new and completely different and completely amazing. So I'm, I'm driving back from Sea Otter, uh, and I'm in the camper van with Danny Van Hoat. He's in the driver's seat. I'm passed out in the passenger seat. And at Redlands, he had told me, you know, I'm I'm pleased with how you've been riding, so I'm going to throw your name into the mix for consideration for a national team that they're fielding in California. And at that time, I was thinking, there's no freaking way I'm going to make that team. So to me, it was just cool to be on the long list for that. And I could have just capped it there and just been able to say, you know, I was in the running. That was cool for me. But okay. But then... Danny in the drive, he slaps me awake and he's like, you're in. And I'm like, what? And he's like, he shows me the email from Mike Sayers, which said in as many words, Sam's in. And that was the email. And then I freaked out and I called my mom, called my dad. And I called my girlfriend, Jess, Sarah. And I was like, Jess, I'm racing the tour in California. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yes. And then I called my dad and he was so excited. And then I hung up and then, you know, there's that couple hours of euphoria where I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm racing it. And I was kind of, you know, in the back of my mind thinking about oh, what if I did race it and thinking about all these scenarios. And then now that I had finally gotten confirmation, I realized, okay, I got to do some research because I hadn't actually really looked into the, what the stages were like. <laughs> and I looked into what the stages were like and I thought, what the heck have I got myself into? <laughs> like, <laughs> and the thing is like, on so it's a he Sam was on the USA composite national team, which is made up of riders from other teams. But Sam, you're the only one representing the wildlife generation team. Where Travis McKay was on, you know, Floyd's that's his trade team, a bunch of the Avolo guys, uh, Alex Hone. But so you're kind of really like by yourself with the US national composite team. Um, and then of course. Sayers and Mike Creed were the were the coaches, and you ha, you'd never been coached by them before, have you? No, I. So, this was the first time that I'd worked with them. Yeah, so you're kind of thrown into this. Um, what did you have any like specific role, or did they put any expectations on you in the race? No, I think expectations wise, they made it clear at the beginning of the race before the whole event had started, look, we're not going to be going for any kind of GC. Obviously, if you know something miraculous happens and you guys are just having the race of your life, we'll try for it. But we're going to treat every day like it's a one day race, go for opportunities when we can. And really, it was just about exposure for the team, exposure for the jersey and exposure for the younger riders. And obviously, I think the riders did amazingly personally i felt like i wasn't able to do that much just because i was floundering every day but uh, honestly the but, amount of stuff that we came away with i mean travis got two top tens one of which was a second place behind peter sagan maybe you've heard of him yeah. he's, he's pretty quick and Come do the show peter yeah <laughs> Uh, we got most aggressive rider for the overall tour. Alex Hone was in the King of the Mountains jersey for two or three days and finished second in the competition. Uh, we had the best young riders jersey with Tyler Stites after day one. And we had someone in the break, I think, every single day. So yeah, that's, it's, I mean, it's four out of five jerseys. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it was a pretty stunning performance to you know and i say be a part of with you know liberally i think but to be able to watch that the team members perform like that and the largest stage in american cycling was stunning it, it was really cool especially after travis's second place i mean it's amazing to be able to be on a team and then have a rider come back and be like man, if I had just like gone a little faster, not gotten boxed out, I would have won. And he says it with such casual nonchalance that, you know, he's like, I could have won that stage. And, and he could have. He could have. The you, finish line maybe been 10 meters longer. I think everyone agreed he was the fastest guy on the day. It was oh, just yeah. a matter of him getting boxed out and having to like alter his sprint. But 
Was yeah. there any part of you like kind of fanboying out with some of the writers? All like, the oh time. my gosh, all the time. I'm rubbing elbows with uh, you know John <laughs> Degenkolb or there's Richie Port over there. I, I try like I tried not to be like that just because in my opinion I think. You know, I don't go for the deification of a rider just because being at that race, I think, showed me that most of these guys are just like everyone else are just regular ass dudes, like just who are really good at riding their bikes. Don't get me wrong. They're (laughs) really good at it, but they're just regular people. But it was hard sometimes not to fanboy out. But I think a really like a nice interaction that I had was Richie Port uh and the Trek Segafredo team, they were sitting at a table just over from ours the night before, I think it was stage four or something like that. Um, it's all a blur, but there's this one waitress who was just kind of hovering over everybody. And to her, I wasn't really thinking about it, but she was just chatting up every rider she could that would listen to her because I think to her, it was just cool to have all these guys here. And then she had talked to all uh, to us at our table for a good 20 minutes and at one point you kind of just like okay <laughs> like yeah this is really cool i'm gonna go back to my food thank you <laughs> and she's still going and then you know we're we're finally at like minute 25 and we're like all right thank you we're good and you know she's like okay let me know if you need anything and i'm like i will and every other five minutes she's like do you need anything can i get you some water i'm like nope and she's come back I'm like can i get you some water i'm like answer still no but thank you Next day, Richie Port comes over to me and is like, was that waitress of yours, like, super chatty? And I was like, yeah, she wouldn't really leave us alone. He's like, yeah, I don't know what the deal was her like, with her. And then we just ended up having a super benign, regular conversation, completely devoid of anything cycling-related. And to me, I think that showed that these guys are just, they're, they're people. Like, they're yeah. people, too. And it was cool because... It was only after the fact, after he said, all right, well, I'm going to go grab something from the car. And he'd gone back, and I was like, that's Richie Port. He's finished fifth at the tour. He's won, like, every stage race besides, yeah. like, at, like it's, it was kind of funny because you only realize it, at, in, like, afterwards. And I'm trying to restrain myself and not just be like, you're Mark Cavendish. Like, <laughs> Because in your head, you can't help but think, you know, when you're trying to level yourself with them saying, you know, he puts his bibs on one leg at a time. And then you in the back of your head, he's like, and then he goes and wins 34 stages of the Tour de France. Like, that's kind of impressive. <laughs> but I think it it was cool to kind of ogle and be in awe of the people I was around. But it was also cool to see that in a lot of cases, these guys are just regular people. I mean, I was in the group Hedo with Peter Sagan, Mark Cavendish, and so you kind of get to see that they're human too. Mm-hmm. Not to and, and again, like not to say that them being in the group Hedo, me being in the group Hedo means that I'm world tour strength, but it just shows that like they're they're able to take themselves a little like less seriously than a lot of people think. And you all deserve to be there. I mean, you earned your spot just like everybody else earned their spot there. So in a way your peers even though they've done races that you haven't done yet i was talking to mike sayers at the start of stage one he said a lot of the guys on the usa team are going to be riding with their future employers yeah. <laughs> were you passing out like business cards saying hey think of me uh track or ef or uh, no Ineos, I, uh, you know hire me for next year God, no i mean i should have had a business card though i think if anything that would have just been funny that but. would have been hilarious um I think personally, I wasn't looking at it like that. I was obviously, I think you go into any of these races and any cyclist has this like dream in their head of, you know, what if something miraculous happens and I get away and I escape and I win a stage solo to me, it was more just like, I wanted to approach the race purely as a learning experience because again, I get there and I see who I'm surrounded with and you have to kind of measure your expectations with reality. And the reality was I'm going up against people who are training for the Tour de France people who have raced like all the one day classics who have won the one day classics podiumed in them podium at the tour podiumed on stages of the tour one stage of the tour and it's like you start collectively thinking about this and you're like all right take a step back this is a learning experience for me because again for a lot of us this was our first world tour race this was our first race of this kind of difficulty because the stages were hard like really hard and so i think we all had to kind of temper our expectations to what the reality of the situation was and the reality of the situation was difficult so yeah you're let's talk about your writing style you're not a pure 
climber mm-hmm. um, or a pure sprinter, but you're kind of good at everything and you can time trial like a beast. And there was no time trial in this race. Yeah, that was a bummer. <laughs> which a lot of people <laughs> wanted. I'm sure guys like you, probably Rowan Dennis wanted a time trial. Well, I think it's funny. Rowan Dennis actually wanted to go to Tour of California specifically because there wasn't a time trial. Oh, really? I think I read earlier in the year that he... Oh liked the fact that there wasn't a time trial because he kind of wanted to test his metal in a race where he couldn't rely on time trialing rather he mm. wanted to rely on pure climbing and this development of his into a grand tour contender personally i would have loved there to be a time trial because if anything it would have just been a much easier day than <laughs> riding six hours on that you know either super slow pace when the break had went or just you know death gripping the bars trying to hang on to the group and crosswinds but uh yeah riding style i think i'm not particularly bad at one thing i'm not particularly good at anything i can pretty much hold my own in any stage type but it makes like selective stage win potential kind of difficult because it's more of like has to be the right kind of situation has to be the right circumstances versus if i were a pure sprinter you look at a profile map that's going to come down to a sprint you can kind of say to yourself okay like i'll be in contention for this or if you're a climber pure climber and it's a mountaintop finish you're like all right i'm going to be in contention for this but for me neither of those are really an option so i look for roly punchy selective races where it's more of a battle of attrition but again that wasn't really an option for me this race because it's like the cumulative fatigue that my body was undergoing was beyond anything i'd experienced prior to that really so recovery became hard as it you know after the baldy stage and yeah i mean it wasn't even after the baldy stage it was just we did stage one the flat circuit in sacramento by flat i mean like pancake flat naria a riser in the entire course so you get lulled into this sense of oh i can hang in a world tour peloton i'm surfing the wheels i'm doing all right this is fine and in reality again it, you know soon as the burners were turned on it's just went nuclear into the circuits around sack and i just realized really quickly like oh yeah okay this is what world tour racing is it's really hard go figure it's super super hard because you're going through these turns and everyone's riding at the front 15 abreast because it's wide boulevards at 70k an hour and then you have all the stragglers behind trying to stay within a draft and they're going 70k an hour and so if you're anywhere behind that front row of riders who are going through the turns super quick then you're floundering and so we do that stage and we're thinking okay how bad can the next stages be? The answer was really bad. Like, it could be really hard. <laughs> so stage two, and this is, like, people have asked me about this stage. Like, that must have sucked. And that was a Lake Tahoe stage, right? That was where we rode from Rancho Cordova to Lake Tahoe. That was 215K with 15,000 feet of climbing in it. And it was all uphill. If you look at the profile, it was literally, there was not, like, a moment where we weren't going uphill. And it, we, I think, topped out at 8,500 feet. And it's just, like... That entire stage, you're just wondering, like, when will it end? Like, it's just <laughs> like we're going forever. Like, it's just not ending. And it ended up being, for me at least, I think, over six and a half hours of racing. Wow. And, you know, we, we finished that stage, and I'm just blown to bits. And I kind of have to reconcile the fact that, okay, I have three more stages of, like, 210-plus kilometers of racing. And you kind of have to deal with that. And the fatigue... From racing at altitude, racing that long, and racing a day where, since it's all uphill, you're on the pedals pretty much all day, that fatigue is just dead set in your legs. Like, that ain't going anywhere. And then because the next couple of days, there's no real day to recover because each of those days had, I think, at least 10,000 feet of climbing in it as well, there's no real opportunity to relax, per se, in the peloton. So there were times when you were you weren't going ballistic, but you're still on the pedals and you're still riding, and it the the level of difficulty isn't based on how hard you're pushing your bike, but just the fact that you're riding for so long. Like, and I think that's the biggest thing that I noticed that I, the team noticed in general was that as an American domestic rider, there's just no way to prepare yourself for that kind of race fatigue through domestic racing. Like they're just the longest stage we do in domestic racing 
I think is, you know, 165k and that's maybe the Gila Monster stage 5 at Tor Gila or Sunset Loop stage 5 at Redlands, but leading up to those stages, you're you've got a time trial and a crit. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, combined that's still less than half of the distance of a stage that we do prior to those. So you could do both of those in a single day. Yeah, like <laughs> And I, I think it's it's difficult to ready your body for that when you can't get it through racing. And so you can train as much as you want, but you're just not going to get the same kind of intensity as if you were to get it through racing. So when you're then thrown into the gauntlet of having to do these back-to-back-to-back 200-plus kilometer stages where the shortest amount of time we raced was five and a half hours, you're not physically adapted to it. So you kind of have to adapt on the spot. Right. And... And so it's your first one, hopefully not your last. Hopefully, uh, yeah. is the world tour in your in your eyesight? So like, is it is it in your trajectory? Uh, I mean, I think hopefully it, it would be. Obviously, there are a lot of things that I think I need to do to make that happen. And I think any cyclist who wants to continue in the sport has a dream of going to the world tour. But having raced the world tour and kind of getting thrown into the mix of the world tour, which is amazing, but you know devastatingly hard like (laughs) i think i realized like there are steps i definitely need to take for example i think if you were to offer me a world tour contract right now i wouldn't want to take it because i just don't think i'm ready for it physically i don't think i'm ready for it and i think it would be stupid to try and take that because it would just wreck me and it'd probably just burn me out trying to like find my way in a peloton of that high level of racing caliber Versus just taking the necessary steps to development, maybe finding like some kind of program in Europe or finding some kind of program in racing where I can slowly develop more into the cumulative fatigue and cumulative volume that is necessary for world tour level racing. Sure. But for me right now, I'm kind of just seeing where the development path takes me. Obviously, in the long term, that'd be awesome. That'd be so cool. But really, I think it's... It's just about seeing where the development takes me naturally. And if that's like a slower path than I like would have expected, then so be it. I think it would be better to take that slower path than go through that World Tour gauntlet, shoot up, spit out, and come out like a jaded rider who's just like, ah, I hate riding. Yeah. I mean, that's so what hard. caused back during the Lance era, that's what caused so many people to dope. Yeah. Because I mean, it was like, well, it's this or nothing. Yeah, there was no in between. I I think teams today like maybe rally. Mm-hmm. They do a good job of having domestic racing, but also mm-hmm. European racing as well, and then a little bit in between. Um, you're being in China. That's so cool that you're yeah. able to race against not just solely um, North American riders, but riders in Asia, mm-hmm. and then the Europeans that want to come over as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's starting to be like now there you have more options mm-hmm. than you than riders maybe did before. And if you're just like, man, I'm going to try and make it big at gravel, you can now do that too since world tour riders and domestic pros are doing gravel races, mm-hmm. every, every big one anyway. I mean, yeah. you, you have options. So that's good. No, and I, I think it, for me it's – Where I'm at right now with Wildlife Generation is a great place to be. I think as an American rider, you only know American racing, and it's great to to develop within a scene that you know because it's easy to find the the progress within that scene versus if you're kind of jumping around from scene to scene or if you're kind of going to different places, you don't really know what your expectations are because you haven't been there. But having raced in the domestic peloton for a couple of years now, and I've gone to these races, I know where I was two years ago versus where I was now. And so it's a lot easier to see the progression. And I think, again, just having the support I've been able to have this year through the help of the sponsors, help of the team managers, directors, and staff, it's been a huge huge change from what i've been used to where it's more of a rider organizer or rider organized endeavor with a lot of the amateur teams so having all of the nuances taken care of for you just takes a huge load off your shoulders and that makes a huge difference it makes way more of a difference than i think i would have thought originally so what i mean you're you're sort of at the pointy end of the american racing scene 
but specifically we've seen a decline in years in american road races they're uh, you know, there's local ones and also bigger ones that are just not getting renewed. And then also just some of the participation numbers tend to be down. Why do you think that, what do you think is causing that? Well, I think it's uh, a combination of a couple of things. I think uh, in large part, people are more interested in cycling culture than road racing uh, per se, which is why gravel events have seen such a boon in, a, in the past couple of years where you don't necessarily have to buy a race license. You can just show up with your friends and go to this event and it's a cool endeavor because it's such a big event for example dirty cans of belgian waffle ride just completing those events is an accomplishment in and of itself because the the terrain and the course is so hard and i think that's attracting a lot of people and the problem is i think for a lot of race organizers just working with local counties and local uh, authorities and permitting, it's becoming ex more and more expensive. And I think that's just because the culture of cycling isn't really uh, endemic in America like it is in Europe. So for, in America, you have the big three, baseball, basketball, football, that kind of take over the little league, uh, youth development pathways for a lot of kids who want to get into sports. Cycling's not really in that pathway or it's not really in the forethought of a lot of parents who want to get their kids into sports. So it's not really in the culture to support cycling. So I think in a lot of these places that are where races are held, local races are held, there's not as big of a community support. So it's harder to get permitting, more expensive for the race organizers, which means they have to charge more for people to show up. And as a lot of amateur racers will tell you, oh, I don't want to pay this much money to go race a race. And so the cycle just becomes this negative feedback loop. And I think it's just the culture of cycling is leaning less towards traditional road racing and more towards what's being called adventure riding. So you have the Epic Ride series, you have these Gravel Grinder series that are going on all over the country. And I think that's playing m more into a different kind of cycling, not necessarily that cycling's in decline, but just in a completely different place from traditional road cycling. Yeah, I mean, a lot of bike companies are marketing their stuff towards gravel and, yeah. and other things too so i mean they're trying to capture that marketplace um what sort of you know if if you could if there's like maybe a young aspiring amateur listening to you what kind of advice would you give them if they are starting to plan out the next couple years of their lives well i'd advise them first off to make sure that they have a diversified portfolio, so to speak, of hobbies beyond cycling. Because I found that in trying to delve into cycling and sport in general, I think it's easy to get wrapped up in your worth as a human based on your performance. And sometimes you're just not going to have a good day. You're not going to have a good week. You're going to crash or you're going to be sick. And your performance on the bike is not going to be what it could be or what it usually is. And you're going to think like, oh, I suck. Like, this sucks. I'm so bad. And it's easy to get your your entire life's meaning tied up into the sport. So I encourage people to find other things that they like to do, that they that they can capitalize on, that they can delve into when cycling is not like giving them all that they need to get. For example, me, I try to write as much as possible. I try to read as much as possible. I try to find other hobbies beyond cycling that allow me to kind of use cycling as a break from those and those a break of cycling and that's what i did in school is i treated one as a break from the other so homework and reading for me was just a way to like force myself to sit and recover when cycling was the break from school and then beyond that i just honestly i encourage anyone to just keep pursuing it as long as it's fun like to me the promise i made to myself is like as soon as cycling is not fun i'm not going to do it anymore because i think too many people continue with a sport and I don't know like you've been around cycling enough like this is a culture of whiners <laughs> like everyone whines about everything like <laughs> that's true my, like my I'm tired like the, the it's my weather, easy day the weather's bad like you know oh I feel so achy like why didn't they why didn't the organizers do this the transfer's too long like it's just like <laughs> and I've been thinking about it a lot and it's just like I got, I'm, I'm doing some pretty cool stuff. I got to stop whining all the time. Like it's, and it's just like this 
pervasive culture of complaining, I guess. And it's funny because, you know, you can joke about it, but at the same time, you want to just, like, say to yourself, like, someone, it's, like, rare, I don't know why, that, like, someone comes up to you in a race to say like, wow, look at this view or something like that versus like, oh, can you believe the moto? He's like, he's not giving us enough space, like, <laughs> and, like all this. And I don't know. I'm trying to shift my own perspective because I'm a huge complainer. Like I'm a big old whiner and I'm no different than anybody else. But I think to me, I'm trying to just shift my perspective. It's like anytime I'm out riding my bike, it's a good day. Like, right. I think that's... And just sort of take that moment appreciate what you have maybe stop and look out at the beautiful vistas or views yeah (laughs) like you know because most people can't can't be a pro cyclist forever no and i think you know i have the good fortune and opportunity to have been able to sign a pro contract and to me it was like that was the goal and i remember that in college it's like if I can just put pen to paper and just be able to tell my friends in the future, like, you know, at one point in my life, I was a professional cyclist. Like I would be able to say like, okay, I'm good. I made it. And now that I'm here, obviously, you know, I have all these other goals in mind and I want to keep going, but I think it's just taking stock of what you've accomplished and what you achieved and what riding means to you inherently is like a source of pleasure and a source of freedom. I think that's important to do rather than just see it as this torturous, Thing that you're you're constantly chasing the dragon of this goal in the future whereas in the present moment riding your bike should just be fun yeah. i think riding your bike like you should be excited to ride your bike every single time you go out even if it's a hard workout you know it's gonna hurt like it's a good time when you're riding your bike and it, and it's not necessarily tied into results no i i think cycling and i again i think that's the hard thing about a sport with cycling as opposed to say running where it was easy to see personal growth or easier to see personal growth where if you where if you ran a PR, you could finish dead last in the race, but run the fastest time in that event that you could have. And that's like growth that you can see. And that's something that you can glean from the event. Whereas cycling, it's so hard to see the worth of what you're doing if you're finishing behind the place that you wanted to finish or you're not finishing as high up on the results sheet as you want but i think every race you got to take away the positives you got to say okay i did this right i did this right I did this right i could work on that but at the end of the day like i can you know i'm still racing my bike i didn't crash and if you did like hopefully it wasn't that bad like i <laughs> crashed in china and again it sucked that if you crash out and you can't finish a race that that's the case but at the end of the day i didn't hit my head didn't break any bones like i'm talking to you right now i just did a workout this morning like i think things are pretty good right now then mm-hmm. i think just putting everything into perspective and relative to relative to perspective is what allows you to enjoy the sport rather than just constantly torture yourself with this idea that okay i need to strive to be better i need to strive to do this that and the other and if you keep doing that it's just going to kill you as a uh... I can't believe I'm quoting Fight Club right now, but as Tyler Durden said in Fight Club, self-improvement is masturbation. (laughs) Hey, Sam, thanks so much for coming on the show. How can people find out more of your adventures online? Are you on the socials? Yeah. Do you have a blog? um, I'm going to try. I'm building a website right now. I'm going to try to launch a blog in the next like week or two. So you can keep an eye out for that. Um, uh, it's going to be called late for the group ride.com. Yes. I love it. Uh, so good. You can keep, you can keep up with me through there. Um, but other than that, I'm on social media at Boardmanito. That's my last name with I T O at the end of it. Um, on Twitter and Instagram. I rarely use Twitter more on Instagram as per millennial thing with generation. Apparently in my generation, Twitter's dead. <laughs> But, uh, and then beyond that, you can follow, uh, you can follow the team actually wildlife generation, uh, through our website. We have a blog on our website. So we update regularly after races. So, all right. Thanks so much for coming and good luck for the rest of the season. Thanks, Brian. And that's going to do it for our show. Don't forget Brian at veloworthy.com as well as veloworthy on Instagram and veloworthy on Facebook. If you've got a question, reach out to me and we'll answer it. Don't forget to leave a review on iTunes or any other place you listen to podcasts as we would love to hear it. So for Sam Boardman and Josh Benici, this is Brian Coe saying stay Velo Worthy.